you to be mindful of lava bombs. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully there is not any bombs today. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to The Cosmic Cast, brought to you by the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. I am Marissa Lowe, and I'm joined by my regular co-host, John Pernay Fisher. Hello. And today we have two very exciting guests. Um, I'm very excited to chat to you both today. Um, we have Anna pardo um, who is on site in La Palma right now. And... I- Jorge Romero Moyano, who I think is back in Manchester now. Yes, I am. Thanks. Um, So yes, you're both PhD students in the Manchester Volcanology Group, and you've been doing some very exciting work recently with the ongoing eruption at La Palma. Um, So how has it both been? Um, What are you both up to right now? Um, So I'm still on the field, and I have been just working with the Involcan team. Uh, collecting data from FDR, which is a Fourier transfer. Uh, I don't remember the rest of the name, but something like about the, you. the yeah. infrared spectrometers. Yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yeah. And then we also uh, deployed some UV scanners that Ben made. Uh, so I have been helping with all that stuff. Amazing. Yes, in my case, I was in La Palma for about one month, and I was working on the Tefra deposits, the products of the eruption, especially those of the explosive activity. And um, it has been very exciting to evaluate how uh, energetic the eruption is in this month. Uh, well, we are now in, in the second month of, of, of eruption, but it has been very useful also to provide new and fresh data to the in volcan people to assess this uh, volcanic activity and, and the impact it has produced in, in the surrounding areas. Yeah, well, definitely. Go on, John. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, so I guess... Um... You know, all of this was sort of not really predicted. And so what's that like then scrambling to then uh, all sort of get down there and, and take the measurements? Is, is there like, uh, do you have like contingency plans for these kind of stuff? Or is it a question of like, let's book some flight, let's get out there and let's get going? Um, on my case, it was more about my supervisor. I met, the first time that I met him, he was like, oh, I'm going to Obama. Would you like to come? And I was like, oh, well, yes. <laughs> There is a volcano going, you know, crazy. So yes, and um, so we planned the trip. Um, we uh, find the, um, um, the hostel to stay and the uh, plane tickets, and then some of the equipment was not asked for. So apparently, it, it arrived the day before we were supposed to to leave. So it was right timing, um, and yeah, so that was that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my case, I was in in Chile before the eruption. Uh, Before the eruption, because uh, I I was there uh, during the COVID lockdown and um, the the eruption was preceded by by some sort of uh, seismic swarm on the two weeks um, before uh, it it began. And um, my, my impression was that it was it was a very nice opportunity to to go uh, at the exact time of an eruption start. So I booked some flights uh, to to arrive to the island before the eruption. Uh, the eruption occurred before I arrived, so I arrived later, and uh, uh, that was my plan to to go to La Palma first and then to come back to the UK um, to um, progress with my PhD. Yeah, so you said that um, so a seismic swarm was sort of detected before the actual eruption. Um, so 
for the listeners at home, that's all, is that all monitored by Involcan? So this is like a volcano observatory on La Palma. Um, is that the sort of stuff they monitor? And how do they get that information out to volcanologists and people who work in the field like you two? Uh, the, the volcano is being monitored by the Involcan, but also uh, there is a big agency, the Geographic and National um, Institute that is monitoring every volcano in the Canary Islands. So uh, with, the, with the network of seismic stations, there was a noticeable increase in the seismicity two weeks before the eruption. And uh, I, I think that the most uh, important element that uh, was a clear indicator of an eruption will occur was uh, the rising of the seismicity from about 15 kilometers depth to the surface mm -hmm. on that period of time. So they release uh, some daily reports and uh, it was pretty clear to everyone that something big was uh, due to happen at that time. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so when we say an eruption, I mean, firsthand, what sort of activity have both of you seen there? Um, the eruption at, at the beginning was uh, explosive, but was a short explosive phase. And then the lava came out at the big rate of a fusion. And um, at the end, it, this kind of activity is, is like a mixture between explosive and effusive. Not very explosive, not uh, very effusive, but it's a mixture of both. And um, the, the main factor that make, makes it uh, impressive is that it is occurring in the middle of a town. So before the eruption, this was a town and the, the lava is coming down into the streets and affecting every building in the pathway of, of the lava. So that's uh, what uh, the, the, the social media and the people was able to see in the very first moments of the eruption. And now on the, the eruption is very similar to that. It's evolving in the same way. Um, so how has it been in terms of evacuations and getting people out of the area? Um, did you see did you see much of that? Like by the time you got there, had most people moved out of the area or were there still, you know, were there people hesitant to leave or? Um, not actually. Um, <clears throat> I think everybody was really mentalized that they would have to leave. Uh, because uh, besides what Jorge said, there was a lot of deformation on one side of the island. I think there was like a deformation of about 20 centimeters. So which that, that is a lot. And for what they have told us, they were smelling uh, sulfur as well, uh, several days before the eruption. So I think it has been quite nice for the police to get people out of the houses in time, which is good. I think it has been more an issue of people wanting to get back to save more stuff, especially the ones that the, the houses have, haven't been lost earlier in their, during the eruption. Um, but for what I saw, it was everybody was cooperating pretty well. So I guess, um, so Anna, I guess you mentioned, so you're, you're more interested in on, on the gas uh, side of things then, and you touched on some of the bits of equipment that you brought with you. Perhaps we could go into more detail then about what sort of gases you're interested in and, and what, what it tells us about um, these eruptions. Yeah, um, well, I am, so it, for me, it was the first time that I was using the FDR actually. Um, so I, I was learning on the field kind of. I think um, what, we do, what, what we're doing is uh, we use the radiation, the heat radiation from the volcano. So we try to point when there's a, a lava jet. And then we measure uh, the spectra that comes mm -hmm. uh, with different gases. And then when we analyze the, the results, we try, um, try to make ratios. So we are currently looking into the SO2-HCl ratios. 
and then the SO2 CO ratios. And what we want to see is uh, how they are changing through, throughout the eruption. Mm -hmm. If they are decreasing or increasing. And um, also, uh, myself, I'm looking at the SO2 degassing, and that is a gas that can kind of give information about how the eruption is going, where the magma, or how much gas we got, we have left, left, no, we have acquired, sorry. And then we can tell whether or not there's a decrease in the emission and if hopefully this eruption will stop soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you have to get um, quite close to do some of these measurements? I guess you're, you're on your way to a location right now. Yes. Uh, we are about usually two, three kilometers away from the bend. Okay. Um, so not really near. Um, mm -hmm. We try to be safe. Yeah. And stay away from the bombs and such. Um, and because these. Hang on, hang on. Just to backtrack. Uh, so I guess you're, you <laughs> you gotta you gotta, you gotta be mindful of lava bombs. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't. Hopefully there is not any bombs today. But um, there was a large ash column this morning. Mm -hmm. Um. So, yeah. So, but but we, yeah, we try to be um, away from from that. And because we just need the the radiation source. Yeah, we can do it from far away. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is really nice. I think we've spoken to a few people about field work that they've done, but it's always been after they've come back, um, not when they're in the car on the way to the next site. So, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, I get there soon enough so I can like turn around the camera and you can see the volcano. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that'd, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Yeah. 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 So are they quite long days in the field that you're having to do at the moment to get the, the most while it's erupting or is that not much of a factor? Yeah, it has been some days quite long, especially when we have to go around because the lava flows have got the roads. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go from one side to the other side, you need to go around the island. Mm -hmm. And that's like about an hour and a half. Um, so yeah, so if the measurements in the morning look nice, we just go with it. But today, yeah, it was a little bit of a mess. So we decided to, to, to go around and mm -hmm. get some measurements from the other side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Jorge, you said you were focusing on like the tephra and the other eruption products, like the, the physical rocks from it. What sort of samples have, have you been collecting? And presumably you're having to get a lot closer, I suppose. Mm. Uh, yes. Well, uh, the, the work in, in the Tefra fallout stuff is a bit different to what Anna does in the field because we have to move uh, quite a lot around the volcano trying to measure the thickness and to establish the stratigraphy of the uh, pyroclastic deposits mm -hmm. as soon as possible uh, because the eruption is still ongoing. So uh, there is more Tefra being deposited in, in every place we visit. And we try to uh, revisit those sites every time there is new type of fallout um, being deposited in, in those areas. So we have been working at uh, one kilometer uh, from the vent, the closer stations, and uh, the, the most uh, distant stations are located about 13 kilometers from, from the bend. So we collect samples, we measure thickness of those deposits. And uh, here coming back to the, to the laboratory, we are able to establish both the volume of, of the material being erupted and uh, also the textural and compositional characteristics of the eruption at a time series, which is very useful to understand how the conditions inside the volcano change over the time. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, more or less our work. Mm -hmm. So I guess are there certain sort of chemical signatures that you're looking for that might tell you if it's gonna erupt up some more or be more active or less active? Is that, is that sort of general idea? Yes, for instance, uh, we, we look at, at the silica variations uh, to see if the magma coming out is uh, more primitive in terms of, of the composition or so less maybe it's more evolved and is uh, more uh, full in volatile content and could produce 
some kind of uh, stronger eruptive activity. Or, also, it's very interesting to, to see the textures and mm -hmm. if there is some mixing between those end members, it can be a signal of, of a larger activity coming in the next uh, few weeks or so. But that's not the case, fortunately. And uh, right now, we, we are seeing very similar products in the time series and, and the eruption seems to be just evolving uh, in terms of surface activity. I mean, as, as someone who does a lot of numerical modeling on these sorts of processes, I know firsthand how useful it is to actually have these numbers, the, you know, this actual information from the, from the scene. Um, it makes, you know, there's so much that you can do with this information. Um, but yeah, so I know you're preparing samples for analysis back in Manchester at the moment. Um, what sort of in instruments are you hoping to use? Yes, I have been using uh, right now the, the SEM, the scanning electron microscopy, um, to characterize the, the size, shape, texture of crystals, ground mass, and the bubbles in the, in the rocks. But also, we will use uh, very soon the, the microproof to obtain the compositions of, of those uh, crystals, ground mass, and uh, also uh, melted inclusions in the rocks. And uh, we are using very simple tools like um, the sieving um, analysis to establish the grain size population, to understand a little bit how much uh, fine material this tephra contains. And um, uh, also uh, some um, microscopes, uh, conventional ones, to, to understand the, the shape and the size of uh, some different particles in the deposit. So that's the general um, tools we use. In addition to, to the geochemistry uh, classification of the rocks that is made by uh, X-ray fluorescence, mainly. Um, so how common or rare is this activity, say, in the geological history of La Palma? Um, is this activity expected or, you know, are there a lot of questions that you have when you're analyzing these samples and getting your gas measurements that need to be answered? Um, in my case, I can say that uh, this activity is very similar to, to the historic eruptions in La Palma. It's a fissure eruption, it's a very primitive magma coming out, uh, tephrite magma in this case. Uh, the eruption is a little bit longer in terms of, of duration than seen before in the historical eruptions. And at the same time, is uh, in the in the largest uh, range of eruptions of of La Palma. So it's erupting a lot of magma, but it's not a big eruption in terms of of uh, the the world volcanoes. It's just a small eruption, but it's large for the island activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite explosive also. So that's a, a different um, condition that this eruption is showing us right now that is coupled with, with a, a lot of fragmentation and explosive activity. That's what, what I can say, I think. Mm -hmm. When you say uh, historical, do you mean sort of uh, in geological time as in before people were living on the island or or? or, or have we seen similar sized eruptions in, in sort of in historical records as in you know 17th century 16th century type type situations or yeah the, the historical eruptions are constrained uh, in the last four or five hundred years oh, okay so right yeah there are many different eruptions in, in this place uh, i will say six or seven probably and uh those historical events are very similar also to the Holocene eruption. So it's 
more or less the same uh, during the whole Holocene. The Holocene being, now uh, excuse my glaciology, that's, uh, is that? It's about 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so as someone who, I guess would kind of call himself a volcanologist, but has sadly never seen any active volcanic activity, how has it been for you to see seeing live, live eruptions and lava bombs, hopefully from a distance? Um, how has it been, you know, have, have you seen uh, active eruptions in other places around the world or is this your first time seeing an active volcanic eruption? Uh, for me, it's the first time, and it was. I still can't believe it that I'm here. To be honest, like every time, like I wake up, and I when we go to get breakfast, we see the volcano. I'm like, oh, that's that's real. Like I'm still here. Like, and um, so it has been like an amazing experience. Like he has to get to feel like the sound and the the heat from the lava flows as well. Um, yeah, it's like a volcanology class, but live. Yeah, so it has been quite cool. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, I guess obviously a lot of this work then is get and it's going to end up in your PhD uh, theses. And uh, so, how has this sort of changed your PhD plans? Are you having to sort of revise and, and drop certain bits of what was originally planned for your projects, or is this all still extra stuff, basically? Um, for me, it's going to change a little bit. I was working in another volcano, and probably more stuff is going to come from here, hopefully, than mm. on the other volcano. Um, and I do also ground deformation, and because here the ground deformation was quite big, mm -hmm. probably something hopefully will come uh, out of that as well. So the idea is combine the measurements and the ground deformation. Yeah, in my case, um, this eruption, well, it, it's not the first. I, I have seen different eruptions in, in Chile before, uh, also in Ecuador, uh, but no. no no one of, of those eruptions is similar to this one because uh, right now uh, we we are witnessing the the, the uh, beginning uh, the, the 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 initiation of of the building of a new volcano so that's new for everyone I think and for many people working in volcanoes this is not the usual stuff and. Uh, it's quite impressive. It's, it's very uh, exciting to be close to an active volcano that is continuously changing every time. Uh, but also it's scary and uh, we have um, had some opportunities with, with Anna and with the rest of the team to experience some um, hazardous situations when, when you don't know really how close are you and if you have to go away from the volcano because it is showing a uh, different kind of activity that could be at some point uh, dangerous for mm -hmm. people. So it's a, a very exciting thing. And as, as long as, as you are not very close, it's a, a very nice stuff, but, but at the same time it's sad because uh, Many people is uh, losing their houses. About 2,500 people have lost their properties. And it's really sad to see how the lava is uh, eating every, every infrastructure in the pathway. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's what, I, what I think. Yeah, that's that's a, yeah, definitely a really important perspective to have. Yeah. I guess you don't really always see from the the big pictures you see on the news. Um, have you had the chance to like speak to any, you know, people local to the area about what it's what it's been like, and um, you know, what were their expectations living in an act in an area of active volcanism? Um, did they foresee this coming or? Are they completely shocked by this? Well, in my case, uh, I have talked with a few people, not too much, uh, because uh, most of, of uh, the population living around this um, ex exclusion zone 
has been evacuated and they don't enter uh, to this area as we do. Um, but these people, uh, of course, feel this uh, uns uncertainty about how the eruption will develop in the next few months. And they don't have a clear idea on how the government will help them, will support them to um, be uh, reassigned to other places in the island to have new houses. They have lost everything. I, I will say that it is not uh, losing the house, it's, it's also losing the history of the house, their family um, history, the culture, and um, many other immaterial uh, things. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very complicated, but at the same time, I have never seen anyone uh, hating the volcano and the, the activity. So uh, they understand that this is a volcanic island and it was possible to, to have a new eruption. And sadly, it was in the back, in the background, in, in, in the around the, their houses, but it's not uh, surprising at that point. Mm. Yeah, it is, I suppose, hard to imagine as someone who's lived in the UK their whole life, hard to imagine the, uh, maybe not innate, but yeah, over many years, you know, just having that as part of your life, part of your culture and understanding that that is just part of where you live, but yeah. Yeah, particularly when the last eruptions or large eruptions are so long ago, I guess it's easy once things drop out of uh, living memory to sort of put these things on the back burner, isn't it? Because um, mm. I, I guess presumably it's quite difficult then in terms of quantifying you know, the loss that we've seen now. And it's quite, I guess, it's, is it quite difficult to sort of predict when this might, when the eruption might stop and, and therefore, you know, when people might be safe to sort of return to to their to their area to, to their bits of the island and and, and you know see what they've lost this type type situation. Yeah, uh, so we are trying to predict. Well, you can really predict it, right? When the yeah. eruption is going to stop, just to get an estimate of what when we think it can stop. Uh, but besides the hazard of the volcano, we also there has been a lot of ash falling. Mm -hmm. Um, so other issue is a uh, is rainy rainy season here. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an increased worrying about um, a strong raining rain coming and causing like mud floods and lars yeah. because there's quite a few channels that are like covered by ash and then there is houses right outside the channels. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that, that could be a really big issue. So, so I, I guess before they can return to the to the houses, they will need to figure out how to protect them from from those hazards as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that really. Um, yeah. Um, on a slight tangent, then I guess so. Obviously, you know, you've got special permission to be there. Have you encountered many other scientists that are working on the area? Or, or is it just a very sort of limited number of people that are allowed to, to access this site and to work on it? Yes, well, regarding to your question, uh, there are about 100 scientists working on the island at different times, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, as this volcano is very close to the uh, European region, you can uh, fly over there and, and, and study the volcano very easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this sense, it has been very different to other volcanic eruptions elsewhere because the Involcan people has been very open to receive any new scientific group and they are kind to collaborate. And at this point, all these people is working to supply uh, the Involcan with information 
but at the same time, they are uh, collecting data uh, for research and for uh, publications, for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's very nice. It's, it's a very nice way to, to work because some of this information is very useful for the volcano monitoring and to understand how the volcano will continue erupting in the next few weeks or so. I mean, presumably you must all be staying in the same hotels and stuff. Must be weird going into the lobby and, and seeing all your all your colleagues and your peers <laughs> you know, having their <laughs> breakfast. Not, not now. Uh, it's it's like uh, most of, of these people is staying at, at different places. But uh, I think it has been like a field uh, international conference in volcanology. You can see everyone there and uh, you can meet very nice people in the field working uh, at the same time as you work there. It's, it's, a, it's really nice. It's a unique opportunity to, to discuss with uh, most of them about the, the volcanic eruption. Mm -hmm. oh, Anna, I'm really impressed with your phone and um, like internet so far. It's doing real well. How's the journey going? Good. My um, so I'm with a, a colleague from Volcan, and he's driving like super slow and trying to find places that where I have connection to stop a little bit, like driving slower. So he's been really nice. Excellent. Uh, well, do thank him for us. Yeah. <laughs> um. So so I don't know if we asked actually specifically where are you heading to? Hmm. Uh. So we are heading. So we are staying in a place called Los Llanos de Ariane, and that will be on the north of the island. Um, so we are um, on the south east, I think it is. Um, so basically, we're on the other side of the island. And yes, try to look at the volcano from the other angle and see if the the wind has changed and uh, it let us see the jet to take the measurements. Mm -hmm. okay. So basically, I guess with your gas measurements, you constantly having to basically follow the wind, I suppose. Yes, so this week has been a little bit challenging because it goes back um, towards the back of the volcano. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time the jet is covered. So this is the second time that we're driving uh, this week on this on this side. Gosh, uh, well, you, you must have racked up quite a few kilometers on the car then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, luckily they are like um, rented, so mm -hmm. they can take it. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the sort of, I mean, I, I mean, like presumably um, with the various um, sort of, you know, ash deposits and all that kind of stuff, and how, how are the roads been? Are people looking after the roads or, or is this just so, I mean, is there not much, is, is it too unsafe to sort of clear roads and that kind of stuff? Or I mean, are you having to drive over some quite rugged terrain to get to where you need to be? Um, so on this side, like the one that I'm going now is like um, a war place. Uh, the first time that I came here, everything was covered by, covered by ash. Like you have at least like in some places two meters of ash deposits. Mm -hmm. but, wow. So some yeah, some of the houses you could only see like the the top of the of the roofs. Um, mm -hmm. on the other side of the island, because people are living and going to work and driving, they are cleaning the ash pretty much every day. So it's really really clean. Um, so yeah, you need to be careful, of course, when you're driving. But it has been quite safe, yeah, because they they try to clean it before it gets too too high. Yeah, and have you got worry about air quality and breathing and stuff, or is that not too much of a concern? Uh, like the plume has been going mostly high, so it hasn't been a big issue. Uh, but some of the days it got uh, towards the valley, and uh, it, it was pretty dark like it was like eight in the morning and I saw a video of a banana plantation and it was pitch black like they were collecting the the, the bananas and they couldn't see anything because of the all, all the gas that, that has gone into the and the ash that has gone into the banana plantation wow yeah. um when you're taking measurements or say getting close to the vent do you need to wear like special ventilation masks or anything like that yeah we we need to wear the helmet. Uh, if us is falling, we also wear some goggles and then the mask. Yeah, this big mask. I think I have one I can show you if you want. Sure, if you've got it to yeah. hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me find it. Uh, yeah, 
So it's kind of like. Okay, yes, like a respirator, basically. That's okay. cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, this may be a very uh, ignorant question, uh, but I guess when, when the ash falls like this, is it is it cold or is it still warm? Uh, I think it depends on how close you are. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes uh, when the particles are very um, thick, very big, um, two or three centimeters length, uh, you can still feel uh, it is uh, warm, mm -hmm. but uh, when you are in, in the dispersal axis and just ash fine material is falling, it is cold because uh, it reaches the, the higher levels of the atmosphere before falling down again. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it depends on how close are you to, to the vent. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really cool. Oh, John, listen to us. You can tell we've not done field work in a, in a while, can't you? We're here going, ooh, show us the mass. Ooh, is it warm? Ooh, what's it smell like? Yeah, quite. Not much opportunity for us, alas, is there, Marissa? Um, <laughs> not really. Yeah. I think we need quite a big research grant. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Anna, how's the, how's the view outside? Um, so there's construction right now, and uh, well, it's really great. It looks like Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as cold, though, presumably. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Also, it has gotten a bit chilly, uh, but not, not as, as, as cold, no. But, uh, but yeah, the plume is really low today, so it yeah. is uh, like, yeah, really great. And, we also having the plume from the delta coming in towards the, the, the island. So mm -hmm. it is a little bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so yeah, but right now it's construction. That's why I'm like shaking a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I get what are, I guess what, um, what are your future plans, both of you? I guess, so Anna, you're out, how, how long are you out there until, and then, and then Jorge, are you planning to go back at all? I think I'm gonna stay a couple more weeks for now. Oh wow! So then, you've been out there quite a long time then, really. Yes, and then we will see. It depends if the volcano stops or mm. if we decide that we we can use more measurements. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, in my case, I for now I, I have um, all the information I need to um, start working on this. And uh, but I, I think I, I would like to come back mm -hmm. uh, when the eruption stops because mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's, it's difficult to get closer to, to the volcano and to observe some deposits and, and some geomorphic uh, features of the cone uh, with this kind of activity and will be much useful if uh, the volcano starts erupting and then you can get closer yeah. to see uh, in, in a better detail. Yeah, I guess, uh, well, that could be at any time, I guess. But presumably if, uh, if there's a massive uh, bout of eruption and there's a lot more tephra being deposited, would you, would, would, is there always scope for sort of uh, ad hoc trips back, uh, back out there? Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, that's cool. Um, so, Jorge and Anna, we have a question that we ask all of our guests. And I often feel quite silly when I ask this, but I feel especially silly today. Um, if you weren't chasing volcanic eruptions quite around the world, <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah, if you weren't studying active volcanoes um, and doing your PhDs, what else? would you want to do? What else do you think you would have done as a career? I think I will have, oh sorry, I think I will have uh, liked to be an Olympic athlete. Mm. Oh wow. Very noble pursuit indeed. Any particular uh, athletic field? Yeah, or? Probably either track and field or swimming. Mm -hmm. Oh amazing, oh cool. Are, are those like things that you keep up in your spare time, like swimming or anything? I, no, I used to do uh, track and field. I used to, uh, I, I used to do softball, mm. uh, 
but not anymore. That's cool. Well, yeah. I guess uh, I guess the sprinting might be useful for anyway from pyroclastic deposits. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Well, what about you, Jorge? Um, I think uh, filming and uh, taking photos is another passion that I have. Um, it's, it's really nice to complement a little bit with, with this kind of uh, profession mm. that you can travel and do nice photos and do nice videos. But, yes. uh, at the same time, I think, yes, uh, dedicating to, to that could be very interesting also. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, 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 I feel like I've seen some of your volcanic pictures on Twitter. I think I think mm -hmm. that was yes. I think oh, yes. I remember thinking they were they were pretty good actually. Yes, indeed. Yeah, if you don't if you don't mind, Jorge, I could I could share like your your Twitter and your Instagram in the episode description because I've seen lots of your pictures and yeah. they're they're beautiful. Um, amazing. Well, it's been wonderful to speak to you both. Thank you so much for your time, um, especially you, Anna, while you're out in the field. This is admirable multitasking. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, can't, yeah, I really can't wait to hear about all the results that you've both been collecting um, and best of luck with your PhD research in general. Um, well, see you back yeah. in, uh, in Manchester when you get back, uh, Anna, I guess. <laughs> yeah, safe safe travels around La Palma. Yep. Um, but yes, thank you so much to you both again. Um, I'll put links to Twitter and Instagram and things like that in the episode description, as well as the links to our social media. Um, but yes, Thank you everyone for listening at home and thank you again to Jorge and Anna. Thanks everyone, bye!